Welcome to Sunday Worship with Advanced Community Church. My name is Scott Prentice, and I'm privileged to be the pastor here of this church that's located just north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We would want to invite you to connect with us. You can download our app at Advanced Community Church. There you can find all sorts of resources that are there to help you grow, connect with the Lord, and connect with this local church. There you can also uh, find resources for your children, if you have children in your home, and opportunities there for uh, you to connect with the Lord with different Bible studies and resources like that too. As we begin our time together, I wanna invite you to join me in this profession of faith. It comes from 2 Peter 1, verses three and four. We believe and therefore confess that his divine power and grant has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. All of the gospel points to Jesus Christ. He's who we confess together. Would you join us in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our God and Father, would you be with us as we worship you today? And I ask, Lord, that this time would be pleasing to you in your sight, the one and only living God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy is the King 
who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing. together for the fatherless we pray be the father let those who lost their way be understood for the widow and the broken be the lover who will hold them for we know that you are God and you are good yes we know that you God and you are good. Those who mourn today be the comfort. Hunger after you, be satisfied. You bless the poor spirit for heaven is their kingdom we know that you are god and you are good yes we know that you are god and you are good you are god you're the Be 
broken, pour out your spirit. Jesus, our hearts are open. Come now in power and let our chains be broken. Pour out your spirit. Jesus, our hearts are open. Come now. Well, if you have a Bible, uh, I, would want to, I want to invite you to open to 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. It'll be easier if you follow along with your own Bible, but if you don't have one, uh, don't sweat it. I'll have the verses up on the screen. We're in a series on prayer, and the point of the series is what would happen, what would it look like if we prayed prayers that God has guaranteed already that he would answer? And so today I'm going to look at, we're going to look at together why we should pray through the lens of these verses. And then I'm going to take these verses and give you a model of how you can pray by using the Bible. When we pray in such a way that we're using the Bible, it's guaranteed that God hears and God will respond. And so as we look into why we should pray and, and how we can pray, uh, my aim is for this to be an encouragement to you as we dive into this together. So over the next 20 minutes or so, um, I want to invite you to open up the Bible uh, to this passage in 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll dive into it together and see what God has in store for us today. Before we do, I want to invite you to pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have in store for us through your word today? 
ask, Lord, that this would not only be something uh, that is practical and, and helpful to where we are, but I ask, Lord, also that we would see a clearer picture of who you are and who Christ is, how you're working in ways uh, that are much bigger than ourselves. And, and we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Starting in verse 1, what Peter is doing here is he's going to talk about um, who we are as Christians, who this audience is that he is writing to. He's writing to a particular uh, group of people, his contemporaries at this time back in the first century, but he's also writing to us today in the 20th century. And so he's going to talk about things that are happening in more of the spiritual realm, but then he's also going to talk about what's happening in more of the visible realm. And I'll explain that as we go along here. The main focus of this text is he is saying, Everything within our lives should be all about the person and the work of Jesus Christ, what he has accomplished on our behalf. We call this the good news, the gospel. See, according to the Bible, without Jesus Christ, there is no creation. Without Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. Without Jesus Christ, there is no change in how we can uh, ch experience change in, in coming from uh, spiritual death to spiritual life and grow in this good news of the gospel as God's people. And without Jesus Christ, all of our hope in tomorrow and all of eternity um, doesn't mean anything. We need Jesus Christ, not only for the beginning of all time as we see time, but also for all eternity as presented within the Bible. And so as Peter's going into this, he is explaining to us, here's who we are as a church, as the people of God. And then he's also going to be talking about uh, what is happening in the spiritual, uh, spiritual and practical uh, realms, the physical realms. So as we go through this, uh, I'll break it apart in three sections. I'll read a few verses verses and then explain it, a few more verses and explain it. The goal isn't to go into great detail, but the goal is to be very helpful in our understanding of the word and then also helpful in how we can live out a prayer life that really does make a difference within us, but also within our character and interaction with other people too. So let's dive into it together, starting in verse one, halfway through that verse. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter is communicating to the church. He's saying, if you have, have uh, received this gift of the gospel, if you believe in Jesus, in his life, his death, and you've placed your trust in his work on the cross and his work through the resurrection and now his work as the reigning king of all kings who sits on the throne in all power and authority, if you are a Christian, then Peter is saying that the, the righteousness that we have is the same righteousness that Peter has. Within the kingdom of God, there's not a hierarchy of super Christians and super saints. Um, there are people who are more famous than others, but there are full devoted Christians who have lived lives of great meaning and value that you've never heard of, no books have been written on, or anything like that. Within the body of Christ, within the family of God, we are one. And so Peter is saying because of the work of Christ and because of all of his righteousness, which has been freely given to all who place their faith in Jesus, we are all one. And so that's why we see at the beginning of so many of the letters in the New Testament where Paul writes to the saints of, he's saying to the Christians of, we are all one and we all have a place within the kingdom. Now that is amazing uh, news that P Peter is starting with in this passage. But then he goes on from there and as he is requesting there to be grace and peace and multiplied uh, to all the church, he's also putting an emphasis on the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, many people have in their mind who God is based on who they want God to be or who they think he might be, but not necessarily on the God of the Bible. And in Peter's time, when he's writing this, there were so many false teaching about who God is, but not the God of the Bible. A God, instead, it's a God that they had made up. And so Peter is saying, no, this God of the Bible, all of the fullness of God is 
fully on Christ. If you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. If you've experienced Christ, you've experienced God. And Peter wants the people to, who are reading this to understand that this is all about the grace and, and truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the knowledge of him that the foundation of all of our faith grows and thrives and flourishes. And so he's starting there and saying, we are all one, and and as we pursue this Christ, we pursue all sorts of wonders that are beyond our wildest imagination. Freedom and joy, grace and peace, they're all ours. Then he goes on in verse three and four. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Within these verses, he's talking about to the church from the knowledge of God, from the person of God in Jesus Christ, God has given us all sorts of amazing things. But he has given us all that we need for life and all that we need for godliness. Everything that God wants us to experience, all of the riches of his kingdom, he has given to us in the person of Christ. And if you're a Christian, then this relationship with God is not a knowing about God, it's who, a God that's out there. It's a knowing Jesus who is much more personal. And so as we grow in our knowledge of this God, we understand that he is big, the one that said, let there be, and it was. He is also intimate, and he cares about us at the deepest part of our soul. He convicts us of sin. He brings us to life. He works in really powerful ways that we see and other ways that we can't perceive, but we also know that something is going on there, that a change has occurred. And oftentimes that change is in the very, uh, takes root and shape right in the depths of our soul. See, the gospel, this good news, changes us from the inside out. And Peter is saying here that because he has already granted us all that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of this God of the Bible, We have now our own experience of glory and excellence that we didn't have before. Before becoming Christians, life is about isolation, shame, guilt, um, confusion, chaos, darkness. But in Christ, all of the chains that encompassed our lives and and made us all the more confused and all the more isolated, uh, those things in the former way of living are now gone. God has opened up our lives to great freedom and joy. And that's what Peter is saying. Grace and peace be multiplied uh, to you because of Christ. But he's given us, he's already granted to us his precious and great promises as well. All of those promises as Christians, all of those promises take their shape in Christ. And so the idea that we're partakers of this divine nature means that We have been brought from death to life, from out of darkness and into his great light. As he has done that, he is now changing us from one degree to another into the very image of Christ. Not only individually, but more so corporately as the people of God. And so if God is our father, then the people who are Christians, we are now brothers and sisters, one with another. And collectively, we are the body of Christ being changed from one degree to another into the image of Christ. That's his divine nature. And this change, like I said, is happening from the inside out. But then he goes on to say in verses five to seven, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, which is excellence, and with virtue, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brother affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." So those are verses five to eight. So what he's presenting here is he's saying all of those things before are all of ours as a church, as the people of God. 
All those things are, are done in the spiritual realm. But then he says, within you, what God is creating by his power and through his spirit, he's given us these seven aspects of our faith, these seven characteristics or virtues, one on top of another. And so it's not like some Christians have some of these or only progressed into a few of these categories, but this is related to the gifts of the spirit or the gift of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. They all work together. In this case, how Peter is presenting it, it's like a staircase, all of them connected one with another. And so as you see this staircase, he's saying these virtues are within you. Because of the promise of Christ, these virtues now take shape as we get to know this God of the Bible. And as we get to know this God of the Bible and these virtues are taking shape, then our lives will not be ineffective. They will be very effective. They won't be unfruitful. No, they will be very fruitful, which in the Bible, when it talks about being fruitful, that means that there's going to be evidence that the work of God is taking place within us. And so they will, what's happening in our heart will be seen in how we live, uh, what we say, what we talk about, and what we do, the way that we think about and process the world. Since last week, we talked about wisdom and seeing the world through the eyes of God. Now here, what we're seeing is, is that as we see the world through the eyes of God, these virtues, as we grow in our intimacy with God, these virtues take greater shape. And so why do we pray? We pray so that our lives would have great meaning and so that our lives would be effective and so that we would redefine a healthy understanding of what success is because success in the kingdom is very different than success in the world. Success in the world might be our outer image looks like everything's great. Our family looks like everything's put together. Um, we are growing as, as people uh, who fix up our homes or at work. You know, we're climbing the corporate ladder or whatever that is. We have all sorts of academic uh, successes that are there. But godly success is more geared towards the poor, more geared towards the humble, more geared to the ones who, who position themselves and say, God, you are the one who reigns. You are the one that rules. The world revolves around you. It doesn't revolve around me. And so praise be to you, not to me. As we grow in our Christian maturity, we grow in our understanding and application of humility. And so we live lives with more open hands saying, this is all about you, not about me. So why should we pray? We pray to grow in our intimacy with the God of the Bible, our intimacy with the one who really matters, who the one who is worthy of all of our worship and attention. We grow to know the one who created us because he has a design for this life that is definitely different than our own design for how we want this life to be. But his ways are always better than ours and his, his ways are always higher than ours. He understands things that we don't understand. And so as we follow him and grow in these intimacy, uh, relationship with him, as we grow in this intimacy, then our joy and our peace and this grace will abound all the more within us. So the first and foremost reason we pray is to grow in our relationship with the God of the Bible. How can we pray? I want to go into a blueprint of it. So if you can think of the letters P-R-A-Y, P-R-A-Y. And, and these four letters will represent four steps of how you can pray through the lens of the scriptures. And so here's what it would look like. It would start with P, praise God. Now, what does that mean to praise God? How do I take what is in this passage and respond in prayer after reading it to this, uh, this praise of God? How would we do that? Well, first I would be looking at ways that, that through the lens of what I'm reading that should lead to some sort of gratitude. How has God revealed his purpose? How has God revealed himself? And in that revealing, there's, there's an aspect within me that should be grateful. So I can think about things in this text just off the top of my head. God, you've you say that we are on an equal standing with all of the saints before us. We are all one. We're all brothers and sisters because of Christ. So I might start in by praising God and saying, 
Thank you, God, for giving all of us in Christ as Christians this position of equality at the foot of the cross. Our lives are not our own. We were all bought with a price, the price of the blood of Jesus himself. And so that blood, that price that was given gives all sorts of value to me. And so thank you for having an equal standing with all of us as brothers and sisters and saints within your family. But I would also look on and say, God, thank you for giving me all that I need for life and for godliness. You've called us out of spiritual death to spiritual life. Thank you for giving us this new life and empowering us within this life. Imagine it's, it's Christmas morning. And all of us have different memories of, of Christmas. But one of the things that, that I think about as a parent is giving a gift to one of my daughters or all of, all of our daughters, giving gifts to them. And just imagine when they were little, they, they were so excited to open the box, rip off the, the uh, paper from the gift. And they're like, wow, look at this toy. This is amazing. And they get it out. And they're like, I can't wait to play with it. Thanks, mom. Thanks, dad. Or if the gift is from their grandparents, you know, thank you, grandma, or thank you, grandpa. Thanks for given that uh, to us. And they open it up and they want to play with it. And then it says that that infamous phrase right at the bottom in small print, batteries not included. And because it's Christmas Day, it sometimes is hard to find either stores that are open or stores that are open that actually have batteries in stock. And so you're like, oh, I got to wait until they open again for you to get the batteries to play with this toy. God doesn't work that way. When we come to faith in Christ and have this new life in him and experience all of this freedom and all of this joy, everything is already included. He has given us everything that we need, all signed, sealed, delivered through Jesus, through the power of his spirit. He has given it to us. We are lacking nothing to live these lives that God wants us to live. And so I might say, praise you, God, for giving me everything that I need for life and godliness. Thank you that I'm lacking in nothing. Then I move from praise God into R, which would be recite his word. And so what I'm looking for is where in these verses uh, is there something that I can hold on to? Now, I need to read this in context. I want to make sure that I'm reading verses around it to make sure that I'm understanding it right. But it says specifically in these verses that God has given us great power and great uh, promises. And in this text, he's saying this promise that we have been given is this goal of divine nature, this, this uh, likeness to the person of Jesus Christ. He has already given it to us. And so the promises of God, uh, if it's right here for us, that means that I'm not going to be as prone to the fleshly desires of this world, all sorts of sinful de desires of the flesh, but he has given me a promise of a new reality as I'm being changed from one degree to another. So very few people come to faith in Christ and then all of a sudden all of their uh, big sins are all gone. That's not really how it works. Uh, more so, it's we come to faith in Christ and then there's a slow progression of less and less of the things that we desired that were fleshly, that were anti-God. Uh, slowly but surely, those start to fade away as our eyes are fixed and our direction is towards Christ himself because he is the one who created us and he's the one that designed this faith and he's the one by his grace and power is changing us from the inside out. And so I would say in this reciting his word, I would say, God, you say that um, I have everything that I need. Thank you. You say also that you have granted these promises to us for meaningful life. And so I'm going to hold on to those promises. Thank you for that. So the first part of praise God, all about how he's revealed himself, all about gratitude, recite his word. I'm going to take a verse or a phrase within the context of where it's positioned, and I'm going to say it back to him. And so, for example, just to make this even clearer, I would look up into verses three and four, and I would specifically read something like this. God, you say that you have called us into your glory and excellence. 
God, you say that you have granted uh, Christ's precious and great promises to us. God, you say that the likeness of Christ is ours because of him. You say that we've escaped the corruption of this world um, and, and all of its sinful desires. You say that those things are true. And I believe that. And so I want to come before you and say thank you for giving me, for giving us that promise within this life of Christ. But then I would look on from there and I would go to A. And A is just ask for help. Ask for help. I need to admit that I cannot do this on my own. I can't live out all seven of these virtues on my own. I mean, some days I might be better with self-control than others days. Some days I might be better in showing a, a virtue of patience or love by putting other people before myself. Some days I'm going to do better than that, better with that than other days, but I'm not going to be perfect at that at all. And the idea that I can hold on to all seven of these things and find a great success in living them out on my own, no way. That's not going to happen. I need the Spirit's help and, and I need his power at work within me. And with collectively within the church, I need that help too. To give some context, if you're familiar at all with Jesus' life and ministries from the gospel, this is why he was so harsh against, um, one of the reasons why he was so harsh against the Jewish leaders is because they were like, you need to memorize uh, the scriptures, you need to apply it perfectly, and just, you need to pull up, uh, pull up your bootstraps and just make it happen. And Jesus is like, you can't. Woe to you. On the outside, it looks like you have everything together, but on the inside, you're dead. And anyone who doesn't have the spirit of God within them, if, if they have not trusted by faith in Jesus Christ, then they are not spiritually alive. And they're try they might be trying to do all these things on their own, but they find it to be this overwhelming burden. And maybe that's where you are too. Maybe this has seemed like an overwhelming burden to you to try to live a good and godly, healthy life. And you're like, but this seems so hard. I don't know how to do this. What Peter is saying is, is that we need help. And, and the help that we have is because of Christ and through his spirit. And so and when I pray and, and, and hold on to a posture, an attitude of humility and say, God, I need your help. I trust you because I can't do it on my own. I trust the help of others that you've put in my life because they can't do it on their own either. But when we work together, there's a way that you're refining us. And so in my prayer, I'm going to go from this gratitude and thank you, God, praise God, to the reciting his word, speaking the Bible back, and then I'm going to say, but God, I need your help. I need your spirit. I need your power. I need your ways. I need your discernment. As I pursue you and I pursue a faithful life, God, I want to have that Christ-likeness. I want to have glimpses of this divine nature taking shape within me at a heart level, but I need to be honest, I can't do it on my own. And then I would move from A down to Y, which is your will be done. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he said, um, um, not my will, but your will be done. That's what he said in the garden. And before that, he says, um, as your will takes shape in heaven, may it also take shape here on earth. Everything within the scripture is about the will of God taking shape within us first and taking shape within all of creation as high as the heavens above throughout all of the earth that we see and even what we don't see in the spiritual places in the depths of all chaos and discernment uh, um, and chaos and in aspects of life where we need greater discernment we, we got to say um, God your will be done if I have it my way, that's not always good for me. But if it's your way and in your timing, then that's good for me. So that part of the prayer, I would say like, as I'm striving to obey you, as I'm asking for your help and I'm, I'm fixing my eyes on you and I'm going that direction towards you, uh, uh, would you grow my faith? Would you grow my obedience? Would you grow my trust? And at the end of the day, God, I want your will to be done. Even if I don't see what it is clearly, that's what I need. That's what I want. That's what is best for me. That's best for the people around me. And so by taking this P-R-A-Y, praise God, recite his word back, ask for help, and then say your will be done as the foundation of our prayer, surely I can add in there, and God, would you be with so-and-so, they need help. 
They need healing. They need direction. They need wisdom. And I can pray for other people beyond this P-R-A-Y. And I can pray for things within my own life, things that I need an answer or really am am striving to grow in patience and and endurance, but I might not understand it all. As that is happening, um, my foundation of prayer is secure because it's in the word of God. And I've said, your will be done. And I can pray for those other things, but my prayers aren't primarily about those other things. My prayers primarily are about the word of God and God's will being done. And as he is working, he will shape my attitude. He will give me understanding and he will give me greater wisdom as I get to know the God of the Bible. This is why Peter was saying that we may grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just imagine what would happen if every single Christian, every brother, every sister would grow in such a way in all of our prayer lives where we had prayers that were filled with thanksgiving, filled with gratitude, filled with actually saying back to God his scriptures to him, saying, you said this and I'm asking for it and I'm asking for help. And at the end of the day, I trust you, your will be done. Imagine what would happen to us. Imagine how unified we'd be as a people. Imagine how much our our attitudes one with another would change and how optimistic we would be in our prayer lives. So as we went through this word of God together, these verses, I pray that it was encouraging and challenging to you. And I ask that um, you would try this out in the days and weeks to come. Try praying through that P-R-A-Y. And as you do, see how God works within your heart and gives you understanding along the way. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've given us this time together. I ask, Lord, that we would long to know you more in intimacy with you through prayer. And I ask, Lord, that you would build our confidence and faith in you as we pray. May this be just a blueprint, a way of helping people understand how to pray so that we know you better and that we grow in ways that you want us to grow. Uh, knowing that all of our hope and all of our faith is really found and rest uh, securely in you. It's in Jesus' name I ask all these things. Amen. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus we didn't want heaven without us so Jesus you brought heaven could separate us now. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. Before you, we 
silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to
Because Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves. He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and praise to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and Thank you again for joining us for this time of worship together. I want to close with a couple verses from Jude. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Let me close you in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with our time throughout this week. I ask, Lord, that you would use us to be representation of your kingdom here on earth to a world that is in desperate need of hope, in desperate need of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would call people to yourself, that you would draw them by the power of your spirit to new life, to great freedom, to great joy, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.